Hi everyone. I had a good lunch. I hope you had a very good lunch too. So this is the last, second last session. You know, after this session, you can ask any question. I will try my best to answer to them. Um, session number five will be looking at the consequences and impact uh, of blockchain database in terms of efficiency and service delivery. I think when we talk about efficiency, we talk about a lot of case study, right? So some of these case studies that uh, Rajesh has uh, shared, you know, whether it's in Singapore, whether it's in India, you know, um, some of them are, are useful, you know, and also in the right context, some of them might not be. So what I hope to again achieve is that I will also show you some case studies where you could try to relate that back to EIS and also potentially further down in the future. I, I will explain further why I'm saying it's a bit more futuristic. Can blockchain technology enhance efficiency and service delivery? Yes, no? Yes, don't pull out your hand. Okay, uh, okay, good. So, so I, I think it's good that uh, you know, we, we agree that it can be done if you have implemented the right kind of uh, strategies. Um, and if you understood the theory of uh, how smart contracts are going to work, right, then you will realize that the kind of efficiency will be a lot better. You know? And then if you can look at how AI can be built as an additional layer of middleware on top of what blockchain layer that you're trying to do, that can increase your efficiency and effectiveness a lot more. But for today's context, it's all about blockchain. But please bear in mind that artificial intelligence at, acting as a layer would really help you with a lot more work together with the smart contract application layer. So we streamline a lot of transactions. You know, I kept saying this from day one, the kind of transactions that can be done Maybe using hours right now, it can be finished within seconds. So that will definitely reduce cost. It will definitely reduce a lot of time. And you can use your time more wisely in many different areas. So I think in terms of the efficiency and the service delivery, it will be a lot better. Automation through the smart contract helps to streamline and enforce and eliminate the need for manual intervention. Same thing as what I mentioned, things can be automated, fully automated if you want, or semi-automated uh, semi if you want. So it depends on what kind of task you're looking at. Checking against uh, data, for example, uh, some of you have told me, oh, I could use an SPSS, for example, just to make sure that the data uh, integrity is there and so forth. But you know, if you use a smart contract with the right kind of variables, you can spot the mistake in a, a lot smarter. So, something that you should bear in mind. S a seamless collaboration, you know, whenever we talk about blockchain, you know, we always talk about transparency, we always talk about many different kinds of uh, uh, properties that might not be very useful to you, but seamless in terms of how you collaborate, for example, if you do it with a different department, if you do it uh, inter-agency, if you do it inter-government, blockchain itself can create a certain environment, you know, where everybody understood each other, you know, through a proper consensus mechanism. You can then simultaneously do things accordingly, you know, to, to what you want to convey. So, so this will be a very good seamless uh, integration. Enhance security because of how the data is being captured and how the data is being structured. The security level will definitely be a lot higher than, than just pure traditional database. So I, I want to share um, use cases, you know, and this use case, uh, some of them um, might not be so straightforward uh, to what you are trying to do with uh, EIS. Uh, most of these are public um, case studies. Um, in the public sector. So first one that I want to share is with uh, Delaware. 
So they have a, a smart incorporation. So in the, the US state, uh, Delaware, is in the early stages of creating incorporation services on blockchain records and smart contract, rather than paper-based uh, exchanges. So this is very similar to what Rajesh has mentioned for Singapore. Um, Singapore is a lot uh, easier because uh, before they embark onto the blockchain journey, all the things are digitized. You know, there's no paper transaction, to be very honest. So if everything is digitized, it's a lot easier, the barrier is so low, you could actually do this in a very fast manner. So the process of uh, incorporation uh, includes the filing, uh, documentation, legal entity, uh, legal structure, how you issue your shares, how you issue your bylaw, how you do your AGM, all of this will be on blockchain. This is, this is actually very useful. If you can make this on blockchain verified by your uh, directors and your company secretary, those kind of data, when it flows back to the EIS system, it, it gives a different level of uh, verification. So a digital approach to incorporate would benefit um, the growing number of private companies with complicated equity structure where different shareholders have different rights and obligation. Same thing, you know, Sometimes they change the shareholder, they never inform. Sometimes uh, they change the shareholder, there's typo in the names and so forth and so on. If you put this on the blockchain system, example, if you want to add in a certain field, you know, two people will be checking against it, you know, against a document, for example. So this makes the whole process a little bit more, um, a little bit more less fraudulent. The rules associated with particular investment in a, in a business could be formulated as smart contract and embedded in the blockchain. This blockchain might be used to automate voting processes, ensure compliance, and how shareholders can even sell their shares. So if you look a few steps ahead, you know, you, cr you create the blockchain environment not just for now. You know, it can be reapplied to many different kinds of scenarios. You know, example, e-voting. I've said e-vote for many times within the whole uh, uh, workshop. The reason being is I think using the technology as the as one of the easiest uh, uh, use case. You know, and easy, easily related to the government, some, you know, some of the departments. So this could be something that you could you could do as well. So next one would be the Venezuela. You know, they they have a different set of um, uh, use case. Um, they are actually the first federal government um, to introduce digital currency called uh, Petro. This is a groundbreaking move because the country has a lot of issues in, in terms of economic uh, challenges, hyperinflation, uh, a lot of different economic san sanctions, and their currency is depreciating. You know, so if it's if it's in that kind of state, you know. Uh, their own digital currency would actually make a lot more sense, right? So, as you know, uh, uh, so they offered uh, the local an opportunity to safeguard their wealth uh, and hedge against all the different inflation using this digital currency. So the petrol is based on blockchain technology providing enhanced security. Uh, it is backed by their oil reserve which is among one of the biggest in the world. This backing, combined with the digital nature of the currency, <coughs> aimed to instill confidence in the in petrol and stabilize the, the currency uh, and country's uh, economy. I think this is something that many countries are facing, to be very honest, in terms of inflation. Um, this case study itself is not just about a digital currency. You know, It is not just about that. It is about how the digital currency can be linked back to all the things that you're trying to do. You just imagine you have a digital currency, everything is recorded, traced. So a lot of this money that is being collected or money that, that will be paid can all be traced and then you can use that as a way to check you know, all the different things that happen you know, during, the, during the fiscal year. You know, so this can help a lot. You, know, you can control a lot more, you can understand the people a lot more Task again okay, is a is a really efficient use case. So yeah, yeah, embrace them. You know, you can fight again uh, against this uh, fiat currency. You fight against uh, 
uh, man, uh, this is a government controlled uh, currency. But this is a, just a case for you to understand that things are really happening. So, cryptocurrency provide the Venezuelans with access to international market and financial services, bypassing the limitation imposed by the economic conditions. Um, that they facilitate more international trade. Uh, individuals and businesses are now uh, very open. You know, they are able to look at things in a different different light. You know, because they now have a currency that is backed by oil and it's a lot more stable. So another case study, you know, uh, would be Denmark. So Denmark has taken a progressive step in uh, electoral process using a blockchain for their e-voting. You know, so these are examples of how votes are going to be done. This has also been done in the US. Uh, the same voting system has also been adopted in Southeast Asia, some of the countries. So this provides a certain transparency, uh, a non uh, tempered decentralized way to vote and get yourself to understand the whole process, you know, free from manipulation, free from people who want to, you know, pay to get their votes, for example. So this is a really real use case that's happening in Denmark. Um, I have friends who are running civil societies, you know, they are people who you know, go on the street to protest over the weekend. It could be part of a workers' union, for example. They are also using the blockchain technology to do votes, you know, to, to vote among themselves, uh, to vote against decisions, you know, to, for example, are they, are they going to lobby against A or are they going to lobby against B? They actually use a blockchain e-voting system to do that. Of course, this is very easy to do, you know, and and to them, they, they think that it's more trustworthy. So people who protest are using that kind of system. <coughs> so this whole process has increased accessibility and inclusiveness, you know, um, among their citizens. You know, they are more open to cast a vote. They are more willing to cast a vote, and they are more willing to talk about it. You know, because they they are very proud. You know, friends at Denmark, they are very proud. They say that oh, what what our vote are uh, actually very transparent, right? So the secure nature of the blockchain technology used in the system, you know, enhances the overall integrity, reduce risk, you know, increase accuracy of the whole framework during the, the election process. Implementation aligns with the country commitment to digital innovation and, and a reputation as a very forward-thinking nation, you know. The whole democracy process is then instilled within the whole system together with the blockchain technology. So, if you have, if you know friends or your fellow government uh, uh, friends, you know, in, that, in, in Denmark, you, you can ask them, you know, how how they felt, what can be done better, you know, how they have been doing this. So, I I, I want to, you know, uh, end off session, you know, uh, with a few things. Number one is um, leverage blockchain in the right way to get you the right kind of results, right? Do not just use blockchain for the sake of using it, because blockchain obviously is so much better um, in certain manner. So you've got to leverage what you have. Leverage what you have to enhance your current process using blockchain. All right, and I will end up and end off with uh, three tips, and then I will also end off the whole session with a more open discussion or AMA. Ask me any kind of things, ask me anything kind of session, so that we can all understand. You know, because sometimes after hearing different people, they have different views. Um, you might have more questions in mind. Right, so let's. Three, three different tips for you if you are going to get a um, external vendor in to provide you with the technology, for example. First one is to probe, right? Uh, set up a team that you could begin by reviewing the ideas for the use of the blockchain technology. So this could be a task force. You know, in, in the ministry, you know there's a lot of different task force that can be doing A, B, C. Do the same for blockchain, all right? The, the team will scan uh, on the processes that could improve and give a better result. So you've you got to probe. Probe means you've got to find out, right? 
Then after that, you got to prioritize. You know, the team would need to investigate what kind of benefits you would get when you adopt this technology. All right, if you're talking about votes, records, you know, do you think that it will be more tamper proof? Is it a lot better? Is that a big improvement? So, so the team's focus should be on the application that can yield immediate, meaningful results. You know, not something that is too big and you cannot control. So this is more like a smaller pilot trial that you can do, but you've got to prioritize. Things that are smaller, low hanging fruit, use that, try it, tell your minister it's good. Wow, 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 and then okay, he said let's do something even bigger. Maybe your, your task force right now is only two people. You know, then when the minister says he's really happy, he could increase to 100 people, right? right? So it depends on how you drive the agenda. You know, from a ministry of technology angle, I think it would be very good if you could look in the, in, in, in the light of uh, how you could use the data to help the tax authority, for example, how you could use the data to look at it from a more digital money perspective because, you know, Ministry of Technology should be the one driving this, not, not, the, not the finance or trade industry, right? This is very tech driven. So prioritize, all right? Please remember this. The last point would be partner. So once you have all these things set, within your own framework, all right? Not Andy coming to tell you what is correct, not Rajesh coming to tell you what's correct. No, you know what you need. Find the right kind of partner. Pilot trauma, work these through relations. You know, if, if a public blockchain is something that you want to explore, but you want to have more privacy, yes, there are things that are happening. There are, there are things that we can do, all right? If you, if you want to do a hyperledger, for example, if you felt that it's too risky, then don't do it. You know, find other ways. Like I mentioned yesterday, you know, a blockchain can be done and programmed easily using a couple of lines of codes. All right? So please, partner, find the right partner and add, add, in, add in more, more punch you know, to make it work. After all this successful implementation of a pilot trial, government should proactively consider strategies to build, expand upon all these achievements. So do this step by step. One effective approach is the development of a national roadmap that serves as a comprehensive guideline for both public agencies and blockchain technology providers. So this can be one, of one, one agenda or maybe one strategy paper that uh, EIS could, could really look at. You know, and, and this kind of strategy paper is actually very useful, helpful for you to understand what you want and set a certain standard for all the rest of these uh, partners that you have. So the roadmap would, would offer very clear instructions on the technical standards, uh, the different norms, the seamless integration and collaboration with all the different partners. This is a really good practice that um, I have implemented with several other government organizations. This kind of thinking method will bring you a lot further down the road versus just getting one vendor in to help you with everything. All right? Because all this technology that you're trying to develop, in some ways, you are customizing yourself. You know, he knows what you want. He knows what to do. And that will suit the ministry a lot better. So this could be my last slide, you know, you know I want to say this, you know, we, if we are still really early, try blockchain and make an impactful change, all right? You have heard from many different people, some of them, they are very academic. You know, they will tell you how the, uh, the side chain is going to be like, what kind of TPS, you know, what kind of speed, all these things, these are, these are not important, you know, really not important. Because right now what you see in the blockchain space is just a tip of the iceberg. All right, there are a lot of other things that we could all do together, whether it's from a public sector, public to private sector, or even on a more international basis. If you dare to make a step out, make some impactful change, blockchain could be the one that will drive and pave the path forward. You know? With that, I think this is my last slide. You know, I want to keep things really simple, and I also want to keep things more personal. So right after this, you know, let's, if you have any questions, let me know. I'm very happy to answer whatever I can, you know, one-on-one, -on -one in a group. 
Just ask anything. There's no right or wrong answers. There is no silly answers. Just ask anything. What you know. So thank you, everybody.